Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. It's summer and the garden is growing, but there are a few common problems you might encounter. Also, bring the outside inside with a greenery arrangement from your garden. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Dr. Natalie Baumgartner. Natalie is a residential consumer horticulture specialist with UT Extension, and Mary Hine will be joining me later. Hi, right, Doc, it's always good to see you. Yes, always you good too. To have you here. It's great to be here. Talking yeah. vegetables. Talking vegetables. And guess what we're going to talk about? Five common problems of vegetables. Yeah. And uh, I took a little walk in the trial plot the other evening. I brought a <laughs> few uh, samples with me. Okay. So where do you want to start? Well, I would say let's begin with tomatoes. Uh, we know let's talk tomatoes. king of the garden, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's favorite uh, crop to grow. And probably maybe the most common question that we get has to do with leaf diseases on tomatoes. You'd be exactly right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, I brought a sample here that most likely, we never say 100%, right? You know, I, I, we don't have a lot of samples, but most I, likely is an example of some early blight. And so you can kind of see, we look and we, um, we comment on a bullseye mm -hmm. pattern. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and so of course there are times when it may be, you know, on the tips of leaves, we may have a little bit more damage. Um, I actually sometimes see early blight <laughs> even look a little bit different, you know, on some of my different cultivars. But I think that this is probably the most yeah, that's, characteristic that's perfect. pattern. That is perfect. Yeah. Sure. So alternate area, uh, mm -hmm. fungus, and we can address it in, well, we need to address it in a variety of ways, right? Okay. So one of the things that I do a lot in my trials is actually grow some of the newer uh, early blight resistant uh -huh. tomato cultivars. Okay. And when I say resistant, I don't mean bulletproof 100%, but they can get you a little bit further okay. in yeah. the season. Some of those have early blight. Some of them also have septoria, which is another okay. very similar mm -hmm. leaf disease, which sometimes we may actually see on the same leaf. At yes, the, I have. Yeah, mm -hmm. at the same time. So if you, if you like a determinate tomato, a medium-sized slicer, we have some good options okay. there. Good. If your favorite selections are more beefsteak or heirloom, we don't right. have as many uh, resistant options for early blight. Right. So your best option there is going to be good preventative sprays, but first I would probably actually say probably um, sanitation. And I would. Yeah. Pick up those diseased leaves. Yes, yeah. I would start with that for sure. Yeah. Okay. So um, rotation. Rotation. Crop rotation is always good. Yeah. And, and so, you know, a couple, three years yeah. rotation, of course, ideally we might say four but at least get those away for a couple of years. And then one thing that I try to do, as much as time allows, is actually in-season sanitation. So we know that early blight spreads um, by, um, say, last year's leaves mm -hmm. and you know, some residual um, inoculum bouncing up from the soil. But when we get to this stage of the season, it's very possible that a lot of the spread that's occurring is actually spreading within our canopy. Okay. And so, I know this sounds like a lot of fun, but <laughs> um, I actually go through and clip off diseased leaves to the best of the ability, especially in that June period when there's not very much infection and a little bit of sanitation okay. can hold it down. Okay. And preventive sprays. Okay, yeah, preventive sprays. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so oh, I bounce and forth, back and forth between some organic options. Sometimes I'll use a, a biological product, Serenade or something like that. I use Dacanil quite yeah. a bit. Okay. Copper is an option. Okay, so those are good options. All right, yeah. so what's the next leaf that we're <laughs> going to talk about, okay. right? The next disease. Rolling down. Um, well, I'll, I'll bounce to the other tomato okay. example okay. Uh, here. And uh, if you, now, <laughs> ignore the wilt. That before. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're looking at the distinct lack of. Yeah, welcome to the leaf. Yeah, lack of vegetation. Yeah. Um, and so. The little critter that does this, I actually, um, I spared uh -huh. his life uh -huh. just for an example today. So this is the uh, always formidable in the garden tobacco hornworm, um, <laughs> but they are voracious <laughs> leaf feeders. And so it actually takes a little bit of work to spot them. 
Um, so they'll hang underneath uh, the leaf like that. Um, but most of the time, my, um, you know, my scouting in the plot is kind of looking mm. for these chewed off uh, leaves. And it's amazing how fast just a few uh, caterpillars can, can do damage. And so there are some great biological options. Mm -hmm. um, BT. Yeah, BT. Yeah. yeah. That is ingestion. So yes. they, you know, they need yes. to consume it. And really, as soon as they consume that material, they will stop feeding. They mm -hmm. might not immediately die, but they will stop feeding uh, very soon. So once we get in the middle of summer, you know, just getting that reapplied enough so that there's always some there for, for them to consume. Okay. It totally messes with their digestive yeah, system. We, we don't want those things yep. around. Tears them up. Yeah. Tears them up. All right, so yeah. let's go to the next. Oh, oh, yes, the, the last there. tomato. I guess uh -huh. I did bring 60% of the issues were, in fact, tomato, which that's, may actually be fairly yeah, representative. Because everybody grows tomatoes for the most yeah. part. So that's fine. Um, so this is maybe our most common physiological, not actually um, pathogen problem, blossom in. Blossom in right. rot. And, um, and if we were to list all of the things that are put up as cure-all solutions to blossom in rot, we, we'd probably be here for a while. Um, but the, uh, the geeky definition is what a <laughs> localized calcium deficiency. Yes. <laughs> which leads people to want to immediately fertilize with calcium. With calcium, right? of course. And, yeah. I, and of course, I'm sure you ho heard all the home remedies, you know, yeah. the calcium tablets and pills yeah. and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Tums. Tums. Right? Yeah. Roll aids. Yeah. yeah, I've heard all um, that. So, really, what this is, and to a certain extent, physiologists are still kind of arguing a little bit about some of the mechanisms. Is the calcium deficiency a cause? or is it effect? But what it really oh, is, is the plant not really balancing its uptake and movement of water mm -hmm. that has dissolved mm -hmm. calcium uh, with the leaves and the fruit. So okay. lots of times we'll see this happen early in the season when there's both rapid vegetative growth and a whole lot of fruit set. Okay. Because if you're a tomato plant and you're competing for water, right. the leaves are going to outcompete the fruit, sure. and so there will be more transpirational demand moving through those leaves than through the fruit. And so some of these young cells that are just developing may be deprived of, of calcium. That's a good way to think about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so it's kind of a competitive issue. There are some times when it truly may be a soil issue. I don't sure. mean sure. to say that that never happens, but we want to do good soil tests before because right. if we're in the middle of the season, we're not going to adequately address um, our soil issue, but very often it's an environmental mm -hmm. issue. And so the best thing we can do is even moderate moisture, good mulching. Mm -hmm. Good mulching, right, helps. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and a little bit of patience. And a little bit of patience. All right, yeah. good deal. So what are we gonna move to now? Um, well, I guess, uh, I guess we can talk pepper. Uh, we're, in the, we're still in the same family. And so, you know, <laughs> we give a little bit of a, a similar disclaimer in the sense that we haven't put these under a scope, but we look at, um, we look at leaves like this and we think bacterial spot. Mm -hmm. I do, yeah. Anytime I see yeah. those what yellow halos yeah. that are there, that's the yeah. thing I think yeah. about. Yeah, so we see some of the yellowing yeah. around the leaf. We see kind of a light center, and it tends to be one yeah. of the most common things we'll see on peppers. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I can say that I have done a little bit of uh, hopefully preventative for the younger leaves, copper spray okay. on these plants. So there are some sprays that we can use. Um, overall, we try to not get into bacterial spot, bacterial leaf spot in the first place. There are several resistant cultivars mm. on the market okay. now, especially when we talk about the bell peppers, um, Alliance I grow a lot, Revolution, mm. um, even some of our favorite newer, like All American selections, when Emerald Fire, That's which is a cool jalapeno, yeah. um, some of the um, some of the sweet bananas. So there are some resistant cultivars, and as a bacterial disease, it can be spread by seeds. And mm. so when transplants are young in the greenhouse, a lot of overhead watering going on, a lot right, of splashing. Um, so being picky yeah. when we buy our transplants is another way to kind of avoid it out okay. of the gate. All right. Good deal. So our last sample that we yeah. have here <laughs> last, is... Last. Yeah. But, well, maybe at yeah. least. He is a, he is a sad, <laughs> sad is guy. Sad. <laughs> yeah. That is sad. So maybe the most common 
leaf disease that we see on our <laughs> cucurbit family, powdery mildew. Okay, powdery right? mildew. Um, and, and we have it on the top, we have it on the bottom Golly. of the leaf, and he's going to be a detriment in a couple of ways. Okay. Uh, so he is, of course, pulling nutrients from the leaf, so he's a, essentially parasitic at this point in time. But with this level, he's also kind of interfering with the ability of the plant yes, to, you know. the photosynthetic <laughs> process. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, and cucurbits really like their, uh, their leaf area. So, um, so I will readily admit that at this point in time, we're not going to get a lot of control okay. of yeah. this leaf. Right. Um, but I have put a preventative fungicide on the plants to try to protect the younger leaves. There are some cucumber, there are several pumpkin cultivars that have um, butternut squash, some powdery mildew resistance. Okay. Um, but what's interesting about powdery mildew is um, oftentimes we may see it more on the edges of the season than the main mm. season. It is not a hot, hot weather. Right. Um, okay. Pathogen. I actually see it more. Well, you see it in our zinnias. We yeah, see it in a lot. Yeah, yeah, in a lot of our all flower beds. Now, it doesn't require free water to sporulate like um, many okay. other leaf fungal diseases. But um, but it, you can tell it's it's reproducing pretty well. That high humidity will. Yes, and, and crowding too. You know, it could be yeah. an issue. You want to make sure you get good air circulation. Yeah. Right. Sure. Yeah. So it can dry off. Yeah, good deal, Nella. We appreciate yeah. that good information and these nice samples from your <laughs> trial garden. So thank you much. All right, so what we're looking at here on this squash plant would be evidence of squash vine borer. Parts of the plant, maybe the entire plant, uh, will be collapsed and you'll see it wilting like we're seeing right here. And so it's important that we scout for, um, for this borer. They lay their eggs right at the base of each of the stalks where the stalks come off of the vine. And when those eggs hatch, they burrow right into the center of that vine. And this is a bit of uh, what active feeding would look like. This is called frass. Um, what's left behind after they chew through those vines. That disrupts the vascular system and we end up with wilt. Um, there's nothing we can really do for the parts that are already affected, but if you have uh, vines on the plant that aren't affected yet, you could put some perspective uh, insecticidal sprays on there using insecticidal soap. You could try horticultural oil, um, carbaryl, bifenthrin, so lots of options for control. All right, Miss Mary, we have some beautiful flowers on the table. What are we going to do? We're going to talk about plants that you can grow, either house plants or outside plants, mm -hmm. that would supplement your flower arrangements. Um, these are things that I like to grow, mm -hmm. and I had to learn this by trial and error because when trial I started, when I started uh, doing flower arranging, when you go to like Kroger or something, they'll give you those little scrawny things that are the greenery, the fern, okay. you know, it's just, it's just not anything real, real great. So okay. these kind of plants you can use and make a green arrangement, totally green, or you could um, put them as a supplement to your flower. Are they easy to grow? Yeah, most, most of them part? are shade plants outside shade. Okay. A lot of them are house plants that I always put outside in the summer, put them on the north porch. Okay. You want me to get started? Let's go ahead and get started. What I thought I'd do was um, take each one and then I'll place it in, in a, um, this is a container with wet foam. You use wet foam for fresh flowers and it's, it's different from dry foam. Wet foam, you soak, you get it wet, and then your flowers will stay fresh mm -hmm. for you know, a week or okay. more. I'm gonna start with um, an alocasia. This it's is a beautiful, beautiful plant. Yeah. It's Beautiful. very interesting. It's very strong and, and kind of upright and stubborn. You can also uh, cut these in a design. Now, some of them I'm gonna face to the side. I might do a L-shaped flower arrangement. So do you already have this in your mind though, when you're arranging flowers? No. Okay, so it just, Yeah, I comes. just go with right. it. Um, this is a, a Aspidistra. They come in many varieties. You can, there, some of them are thin. I like the, the speckled ones. Okay. And it, it's a very straight flower, and it would be a good line flower, meaning you know, it sets your stage for the other things that'll go around it. Okay. So it's called like a line flower. Another thing you can do with this is I have put a wire, taped it on the back, 
I used a, I think it's probably a 10 gauge wire. It's a little, little tough, but it bends very easily. And I just taped it with some clear foil tape. Mm. And then you can bend it whichever way you want to. If you want your arrangement to do something different or move in a different way, then you can do it like that. How about that? Okay. And um, you can also curl it and split it. Here I've put it, <laughs> I put it, uh, put the end of this, pulled it down and pierced it with the, with the very end of the plant and I cut it with a knife and split it up. So now it looks like a whole different plant. Yeah, it looks totally different. Mm -hmm. Now this is, a, of course, it's a caladium. I like to kind of nest them inside each other, small, large to small. And then you have a slight uh, grouping of them and they'll look good to add or just add them to your to your flower arrangement on the sides let them hang down the side yeah. and actually it's called uh breaking the lip of your container when breaking you, the lip mm -hmm. never heard that this is your lip okay breaking the lip uh -huh. and this is a thatsia yeah these are these are nice pressed or spray painted different colors but if if your flower will go down like this then you're breaking the lip of it. Okay. I like these. This is yeah. called leopard plant. Mm. They come in variegated variety also, and they get very large. Now this is equisetum. It's a good line material also. And what I have done with this one is inserted a wire down here, and then you can bend it because the wire's in there. You can bend it ever which way you want to, Pretty and it neat. will stay. Uh, I put the wire down, then I use the clear tape again. To is it easy to get the no. wire through there? Yeah, it is, because yeah, this it. is, yeah, this does has little oh. resistance. It's okay. some, but it's certainly not got, not like a bamboo, okay. you know. Okay. It's easy enough to do, and, and you can have all kinds of uh, shapes to it. Do multiple ones, have some come and you know, make a make a, a design out of that. Of course, the mother in law's ah, the tongue. Mother -in -law's tongue huh? Yeah, I like these because they can be very colorful and they're a good line plant also. Of course, you put probably multiple ones. The the stronger line you wanted. This one is pretty thin. Okay. Um, Solomon seal. Yeah, I like that. It's great, and mm -hmm. and you see, you know, it bends and makes a nice flow to your to your design. Certainly you could put it uh, one on each side of your pot, of your flowers, your vase. I could tell you've done this a lot here because you're yeah. just grabbing, you know, different foliage. This could be this can do this. Yeah. this could, yeah, okay. You can get yeah, a feel for it after a while. Okay. Now every yard should ah. have some grasses. Oh, yeah. Especially this time of year. Uh -huh. Beautiful. They this are time of great. Year to use in arrangements. Usually group them. This is zebra grass, fountain grass, and you could rubber band them together or wire them together and use them in mass. Look at that. Yeah, you know, it just gives this lovely flow to it. Another thing that I love is this papyrus. I love the leaves. Yeah, see, uh, and you can, when you pick them, they'll have various uh, stages of opening up and you could uh, stage them that way in your arrangement. Gotcha. One. Your arrangement is really coming to life. Sometimes Good. it'll turn out really well no, that's and that's good. all you need. You don't no. even need the flowers. And then you have a smaller one that's just uh, just opening up with, in the various colors of green. Okay. I mean, green on green is, is pretty to me. Um, and while you're is, grabbing that, let's talk about your tools. I mean, you okay. good sharp tools. Yeah, I, um, these are nice. These are um, sharp, very sharp okay. scissors. And the stronger stems, you, know, you need a heavier, okay. heavier one. All right. 
This is a form of philodendron. It's a, called burgundy. Look, has different color on yeah, each look side. Look at the stem, though. Uh -huh. Golly, okay. And so you could use, you know, one side and then the other side, and it and it, uh, it makes a nice mm -hmm. background for something. Uh, I like the. We need some ferns, some kind of ferns. Uh, some of them uh, condition better, which means. Uh, you, you would cut your flowers, make a clean angular cut, put it in water. Sometimes I put alum in there. It's a spice for pickling. That works? Yeah, yeah, especially ah. hydrangeas. Okay. It will really keep your hydrangeas. I didn't know that before. All right. And um, I learned that from Rick Pudwell. Okay. At the, yeah, he learned so the much. Tannic. Yeah, just, yeah, just yeah. hanging around there. Yeah. Uh, now, this is just an autumn fern. It, it stays well, it stays conditioned quite well. And then this, the Kimberly Queen is those huge ones that you see on French porches, and it will last a long time. Mm. So not all ferns are gonna stay fresh a long time, but some, some will. I'm gonna make him lean that way. Well, Ms. Mary, while you're doing that, we do appreciate this uh, flower arrangement demonstration. This Thank is you. Nice. It's really come to life though. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. It's a little jungle. Yeah, it's a little jungle. Mm -hmm. All from your yard. Yeah. From your garden. Yeah. How about that? Mm -hmm. Thank you much. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you. We're here in the garden with one of the staple crops of the Mid South Garden, and that is the beautiful okra plant. We have a few blooms here that are just past gorgeous bloom, but I think one of the most important and sometimes misunderstood elements in growing okra is when exactly do we need to harvest these fruit? Oftentimes what we'll say is when they're two to three inches long. And so we have a good example here of a, a growing fruit here that is of course too small, too small. This could actually be a really nice size tender for harvesting. Pretty quickly they will uh, get a little bit larger than would be ideal. They might get a little bit tougher. We can see here's a little bit too large for harvest. Some other larger fruit back there. It's important to keep a close eye on the fruit so that you pick at just the right interval to keep them young and tender. Every couple of days should be able to get you in the range of picking just the right stage as opposed to over mature. All right, Natalie, here's our Q&A segment. We have some right. real good questions here. You saved some vegetable ones. Yeah, we saved some for well, you, like maybe it. a couple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's our first viewer email. What is the best spray or dust that I can put on cucumbers to keep the worms out of them? I have a wonderful crop of cucumbers this year. However, the worms are doing a lot of damage. And this is uh, Tamara. So worms, and of course I'm thinking pickle worm because that's what I get a lot of questions about yeah. because they're feeding inside of the cucumbers. Yeah, right? they are. It's a pretty disappointing thing. <laughs> you have those beautiful squash yes. or cucumbers tiny little holes, sometimes we see a little bit of exudate, yes, so there's little, there's little caterpillars. Yeah, little caterpillars eating away there. Uh, yeah, I'll just cut around it. You can still eat the cucumber. Yeah. Um, so how do we protect that cucumber from the pickle worms though? Yeah, so we of course would, we have an options. There are some more biological materials like a spinosad or yeah. more traditional insecticide. Those would be kind of your spray options. Sure, sure. If you had a screen, you could actually try to keep yeah. out the moths okay. as well if you went for, for exclusion. Okay, yeah, I get with that. So yeah, uh, I would also add to that neem oil uh, yeah. could possibly help. BT yeah. uh, may help as well. And then there's some other pyrethroids that you can get into by filtering being one, but I always like to go with the yeah. least Start with the toxic yeah, yeah. Uh, pesticides yeah. first, and that should help you out, yeah. all right? So be sure to read and follow the label on that. All right, thank you for that question. Here's our next viewer email. I bet you like this one too, huh? Mm -hmm. I am trying to collect pepper seeds to plant next year. Do the seeds have to turn red? This is KC from Wynn, Arkansas. Is this, do the seeds have to turn red? Oh uh, no, it might be nice if the pepper was red, right? So <laughs> right. you know that would be a mature fruit. All right. Um, peppers can be a great crop to to save seeds from. They okay. tend mm -hmm. to be predominantly self-pollinated, okay. so there's less of a chance of cross-pollination. Now we want to make sure they're an open-pollinated 
um, might be an heirloom, you know, not a hybrid that we'd want to save those seeds from. So we want to make sure that the fruit is pretty mature. Yeah, um, oftentimes mature. those, you know, seeds will be greenish yeah. brown, you know, and we'll we'll kind of um, scrape them out from the interior yeah. of that ripe fruit and let them dry a little bit. So it the, they'd be unlikely to be red, probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah not red, uh, but yeah. It'd be nice if the fruit is, uh, yeah, 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 that's right. I like that. All right, Casey, I hope that helps you out there. Thank you for the question. Uh, here's our next for your email. I just ordered potted David Austin roses for fall delivery. I'm in zone six. Can I plant roses in September and October? And this is Lady K.O. on YouTube. Interesting question. So let's start here. Let's go to zone six, shall we? All right. <laughs> so plants should be able to withstand temperatures between minus 10 and zero. So that's your zone six, you know. Can she plant her roses in the fall in zone six? Um, I mean, I think that, that there would be some sometimes when you might get good root growth and a good opportunity to, to establish. You want to be careful not to get them in too late. So that's <laughs> going to be my thing. Yeah, you could do that in September and October, but I wouldn't plant too late. Right. All right. Or you can plant in the spring. Autumn. Right. I Same. would do it in the spring, yeah. of course. I would wait and probably until the end of April, beginning of May to do so in zone six. And I think you would be just fine doing that, all right? So yeah, I will wait till the threat of frost passes, plant it in the spring. Make sure that the soil is workable to do that. You have beautiful roses. So thank you for that question. All right, Doc, that was fun. That's good. Thank you much yeah, for being here. Yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah, good stuff. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. If you want to find out more about the problems Natalie talked about or see more videos on flower and greenery arranging, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.